So thank you for being here, and I'm sure people will be wondering in, in and we'll just keep going. So goals today would be just to talk about IBS as a model for chronic disease, talk about conventional diagnostics and treatments, uh, talk about the functional testing, and here's where I'll give you those tools that will help you differentiate between your patients with a more serious condition and just IBS. And not only will you be able to differentiate, but you'll be able to have new treatment options for them. And then we'll talk about a case study at the end. So our patient population, what is IBS? Well, it affects about 55 million uh, Americans. And uh, many of these people that come to you are women. Many of them have comorbid conditions like depression, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue. It's very common to have other functional disorders with IBS. And as we know now, as the uh, research on the gut microbiome is coming out, we're finding that health and the impact of disease has a large uh, relation to what is in our gut. There's 400 trillion of them, meaning bugs in our gut, more than the cells in, the, uh, in our entire body. And really, there's no single cause of IBS. That's why we can call it this kind of wastebasket diagnosis. Um, we really don't know conventionally what causes it. There are some theories. And sometimes if you find the underlying uh, imbalance, or if there's another cause besides IBS and you treat that, patients get better. But classically with IBS, patients go for many, many years before they get diagnosed. And then even once they're treated, the treatments we have conventionally are not great. They don't resolve the problem. They just treat the symptoms. And, of course, it's in the class of the functional disorders, which are sometimes kind of mysterious. Uh, the other important thing, as I alluded to in the beginning, is that IBS can mimic IBD or vice versa. And so you don't want to miss those patients who have something more serious, like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. So classically, we go by the Rome 3 criteria. That's the latest, the meeting in Italy, where they actually sit down, the professionals, and make the criteria. I find this kind of funny, because it's such a vague three days per month in the last three months associated with two or more of the following, improvement with defecation, onset of change in frequency of stools, or associated change in, in form. And the criteria must be at least the past three months with symptom onset at least six months. And really, if you think about your patient population nowadays, who, I mean, 20% of, uh, of our patients are suffering from IBS. So this is a really large population. This can uh, present with mucus in the stools, um, increased urge, urgency, having to get to the bathroom very quickly, sometimes um, abdominal pain and uh, diarrhea or constipation. There are definitely predominant types, the constipation predominant and the diarrhea predominant, but some people alternate back and forth as well. The clinical impact is that there's no single well-established therapy for this. We can try, and I have a slide in a few minutes that we'll get to on the options for treatment, but none of them are great, and none of them resolve the symptoms completely in most patients. And many of our patients, number one, have been around to doctors for years and years and years before they get diagnosed, and number two, they're trying all kinds of over-the-counter things that promise relief, and most of the time not getting relief at all. Again, the years that elapse, and it leads to doctor shopping. So often these people kind of feel like they have to go it on their own and just deal with their gut symptoms, and they'll even jokingly, you know, I have IBS, I'll tell people that, that kind of a thing. So this says, I'm afraid your irritable bowel syndrome has progressed. You now have furious and vindictive bowel syndrome. They, these are, uh, this is a slide from words that patients use to describe their IBS. So you can see there are just lots of... Um, unknown about the future and symptoms that recur and pain and suffering. Just a few statistics. I mentioned a few of these already. 20% of our patients in America actually have IBS. Um, the annual uh, estimated uh, direct and indirect cost is, to, is $20 billion. And women are affected more than men, often with other comorbid conditions. And it is the uh, second leading cause of workplace absenteeism. I found this statistic kind of remarkable um, because the cold, uh, the common cold is the first uh, cause of absenteeism, and IBS is actually the second. Statistics are at the bottom of the slide if you wanted that. So again, just to review clinical diagnosis, that leaves it up to us as clinicians to make sure there's not something more serious, and that is a conundrum. And it's very prevalent. I've proven that to you at 20%, 55 million Americans. It's higher prevalence than diabetes and asthma. So, uh, and again, anyone who's in clinical practice knows this. They see this all the time. 
and they're not well controlled, the symptoms. So even if we try to treat, often unless we find the underlying imbalance, we uh, do not give them total relief. Now I will tell you, I practice functional medicine every day. And I have people all the time with inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel disease, and other bowel disease that we actually quote unquote cure uh, based on finding an underlying cause like a hidden parasite infection or an overgrowth of abnormal ba uh, a bowel bacteria like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So treating those underlying imbalances, which is again what the testing I'm gonna tell you about today, we can often get relief of symptoms and some really great outcomes. And the evaluation and management is very unstructured. So most of us, if we're wanting to practice good medicine and rule out all other conditions, order a colonoscopy or some other expensive testing to make sure we're not missing a more serious diagnosis. And uh, the statistics say that 50% of people with IBS uh, have a colonoscopy, get that ordered to rule out other conditions, and 95% of them are normal. So again, a cost analysis, there might be some wasted um, resources. So conventionally, let's talk briefly about what kind of standard of care is. Diagnosis is based on positively identifying, I told you, the Rome criteria. So those are the criteria for uh, diagnosis. And often we'll order an ONP in the stool. We can order CBCs to make sure there's no inflammation, elevated white blood count, um, lower white blood count, uh, abnormal neutrophils, anything that would signify infection. Sed rate, although nowadays I'll, I'll just go directly to HSCRP or CRP, but that is an appropriate test. And then things like blood chemistries, checking liver, kidney, all of that. Sometimes you'll see platelets elevated in inflammatory bowel disease, so th that might be a clue. And, but even these diagnostic tests, how many times have you ordered that and they all come back normal, right? So then, you know, maybe a colonoscopy and then that comes back normal and you're still left with this, you know, what's going on? Is it just IBS? Is it something else? Uh, the things you want to wa watch for with IBS-C, which is the constipation predominant type, is of course ruling out obstruction or something else structurally. Um, and if it's appropriate for age, of course, a colonoscopy is an appropriate test to order. IBSD, you want to make sure they're not lactose intolerant, food sensitivities, and things like celiac disease. And again, as we talked about, it's a diagnosis of exclusion, so you're left with a lot on your plate to prove or, or unprove before you can tell the patient what's going on. So there's six main categories in the differential. And these include maldigestion, malabsorption uh, processes like celiac disease, pancreatic insufficiency. And once again, the tool I'm going to give you today gives you some really great clues, especially on pancreatic insufficiency. I use this regularly to find I've had two young men in their 20s, uh, you know, athletes, uh, but they could not gain weight. They had had a full GI evaluation. They'd seen a gastroenterologist. Um, they had had some typical, you know, gas bloating symptoms like that. And uh, what I call steatorrhea, you know, foul-smelling floating stools. We did the test I'm going to tell you about, and I found they had both had severe pancreatic insufficiency. I gave them Creon and Zenpep or, you know, any, any other number of uh, pancreatic digestive enzymes, and they were both um, uh, totally on the way to recovery and were back to gaining weight, and their performance improved as well.